I used, I used to carry a gram of cocaine in my boot at all times. And it was the first thing I thought of when I woke up in the morning and the last thing I thought of before I went to bed. So 1976, that's when I remember being more aware of cocaine. I'm looking, you know, towards going into 1977, going into the making of rumors. Then cocaine really started appearing and you start buying it. And that's what makes it different. And a lot of money being spent gazillions of dollars and i i can remember thinking to myself at that point wow who knew four years ago that that i would then be a part of anything that was this stupid my only advice to anybody who is watching me talk right now is to say save your money because it's going to cost you fifty thousand dollars to go to rehab because you will have to go or you will die i call myself a dope fiend because I'm a dope fiend. This is the addiction issue, but I mean, there are lots of forms of addiction. If you are asking yourself, can I stop this? Then you're in a prison of your own mind. I had been nursing a secret Vicodin addiction for a very long time, over 10 years. To call yourself an alcoholic or a drug addict is a badge of honor because the secret the shameful secret is the reason why it is such a pervasive illness in our industry, in every industry, in every socioeconomic strata, in every country in the world. It is the secret shame that keeps people locked up in their disease. It was such a good time, and I'm not knowing I'm fucking up. I mean, I'm drinking, I'm doing every fucking thing you could possibly imagine. On a, and then I get a call, and on the other end of the phone, says, hi, Jamie Foxx. So who's this? This is Oprah. Uh-oh. You're blowing it, Jamie Foxx. Oh, really? I what said, a nice what? thing for her to do. You're blowing it. I said, what do you mean? She says, all of this gallivant and all this kind of shit, that's not what you want to do. So I want to take you somewhere, so make you understand the significance of what you're doing. Flash forward to now, Oprah Winfrey tells me you're fucking up. We go to uh, Quincy Jones' house and says, hey, man, listen, man, you're doing good, man. We just don't want you to blow it, baby. So we go in the house, and there's all these old actors, black actors from the 60s and the 70s, who look like they just, they just want to say good luck. They want to say don't, don't blow it. Wow. And I was like... I mean, I, they li it's almost like an intervention. Yeah. Because I'm, I, I, listen, I'm, you know me, I was going hard. I'm not playing. And then Oprah says, okay, you want to you wanna meet who you're supposed to meet here? I said, yeah. He's right there. And it was Sidney Poitier. I was going to say, I bet you oh, they brought out Sidney Poitier. Standing in a, in a tuxedo. Wow. Like and the classiest Sydney, guy ever. Yeah, he says, I said, hello, Mr. Poitier. I saw you one time. You were at the party. Do you remember that? I was like. Yeah, I'm, I'm well enough. He says, he says, I want to give you one thing. I want to give you responsibility. When I saw your performance, it made me grow two inches. I was like, so I break down. Everybody sits me down. It was actually Sidney Poitier's birthday. Wow. They made me understand the significance of it. like The history of it. Because they said Sidney did it. And it was it was a it was a character that we could it was groundbreaking and it was a character that we could all embrace. Ray Charles is also a character that we can embrace. You know, sometimes in the Oscars, the characters that, that they award sometimes are a little fractured. This and, is bigger than you. Yeah, it's way bigger. Now you got sober um, a little over a decade ago, mm -hmm. and having to switch from a lot of your stuff, you know, was written under the influence. Did you feel any sort of apprehension or writing block? being sober and writing again? That's a, that's a good question. Um, well, f uh, let's see. I mean, a lot of that material from the old days, I mean, I can, I can pick particular songs that were definitely written under the influence, but I can pick uh, other songs that were written under the influence of a couple beers. I mean, mm -hmm. not that big a deal, right? Yeah. But I found that when I got sober, you know, sort of looking back on from the time that I started playing up until... 2000 and uh, I guess that was uh, 2006. Um, I my partying thing was really a matter of killing time in between gigs. So I wasn't really using when I was on the road. I wasn't really using when I was in the studio. I was always focused on music. So when I got sober, all that sort of effort that I put into, 
you know, would it turn into a massive addiction at that point? Um, I t took all that and just put it straight back into the music, and it wasn't really reliant on me being buzzed or, or should I say, inebriated to mm -hmm. be able to create stuff. Um, you know, so so it was. I was fortunate. I I really just put everything into writing and and felt really comfortable sober and playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in your book, you talk about you know you were raised you you liked the way that you were raised, and it's not like you were trying to you know battling demons from childhood and trying mm -hmm. to drown it in and things like that. It was just like you said, just killing time. Right. Now, do you feel that? Not to say that I didn't have hangups or whatever. Yeah, that, for yeah, sure. But, but yeah, for the most part, mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to bury anything because I had some sort of like massive insecurity or yeah. you know something that I was trying to bury in my past or, or any of that. It was really just partying because it was fun. Yeah, because you grew up around a lot of famous people mm -hmm. with your parents. You know, David Bowie was over the house a lot. Your mm -hmm. dad always had artists and all this. David Geffen uh -huh. was in your house way before you got signed. Um, so, <laughs> way, way so the average yeah. day for you was really exciting to the everyman. So do you think that when you kind of you were out on your own, you were used to kind of your average being that level of excitement, and you were trying to seek out that adventure and excitement. I mean that's a good point, but I, I don't think I was really when I was a little kid and I was in that environment. It was exciting because it, it was a massive turn on to be around people who were creating music and to you know if it was being in the studio uh, for like a Joni Mitchell recording or being in the at the Troubadour for, you know, Linda Ronstadt or whatever was going on. It was exciting to me, but I didn't recognize it as being exciting when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Because um, it's just what you're it used just, to. It was just the environment mm -hmm. that I was raised.